Welcome to another episode of Men Able Matters. I'm Steve Whitten, I'm the founder of Men Able, and I'm joined today by a fantastic guest. This lady is actually a coach and a trainer, but for the purposes of our podcast today, she's going to tap into her real specialism, passion and love, which is being a grief recovery specialist. Uh, it's my delight to introduce Helen Arthur. Helen, how are you? Oh, thank you very much, Steve. I'm very well. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Very kind of you. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're welcome. Well, thank you so much for being a part of our podcast today mm -hmm. and uh, also for being a part of the Men Able movement as well and potentially one of the people that uh, you know, we will we'll be able to direct our clients and uh, people to eventually, I suppose. So uh, mm -hmm. for that purpose, give us a little bit of a background of who you are, where you're from and what you do and how you come about sort of uh, in being involved in grief recovery. Okay. Uh, yeah, so Steve, I am, um, well, if I go back a few decades, which is a bit scary, <laughs> um, I've grown up in the automotive industry with a dad who was, uh, you know, been in the motor industry as a mechanic and then, and then a sales manager and then owned his own business um, and then joined the industry myself in 2001 mm -hmm. and um, in the training. Uh, arena really so looking after training and development and training is a massive passion for me and always has been and I think the passion of it is really about people mm -hmm. and helping people to to be the best that they can be um, and over the decades um, that training has evolved into coaching personal development coaching and life coaching and more recently has come into the realm of grief recovery right. so kind of marrying all of the skills that I I've kind of developed over the years and bring them together into something which I think now is, well, probably has always been really necessary, mm -hmm. but now probably has a real focus. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's how I've kind of come to come to where I am today, really, in terms of now looking at people and, and understanding how I can help them with grief and loss. Yeah. Yeah. So of course we're going to talk about the, the many facets of grief, grief and loss. Um, mm -hmm. But it's kind of what drew you to that then, Helen, what, where does that come from? Cause it, you know, it is a bit of a departure, isn't it? From what you were doing. So. Yeah. Um, do you know what, as a coach, I think I'd often found that you get to a point with someone where you've worked with them and they get to a point where they can't go any further mm -hmm. and they seem to be stuck. Mm -hmm. And as a coach, that had always kind of perplexed me. It's like, well, you know, you've made a lot of progress. Why is it that people get to a point where they can't move forward mm. anymore? And I've been looking at that and considering that and thinking about that for quite some time. Um, and then we hit, or COVID hit us, I think. <laughs> Just a bit. <laughs> uh, like, a, like a large ton of bricks. Mm. And um, I, I sat back and reflected on how I was feeling. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, as a self-employed individual, as a lot of us are, um, and where my business had gone and feeling very uncertain about the future and, you know, very uh, at sea, really, mm -hmm. in terms of, of who I was and my identity as somebody who developed their own business over a good many years. And I, I looked around and thought, you know, there is so much loss at the moment. Mm -hmm whether it's kids not going to school anymore or losing out on their proms or not doing GCSEs or, um, you know, people actually being bereaved by losing loved ones to COVID um, and to suicide during this period as well. And, and so for me, the part that I love about people, about working with people really sort of started to surface even higher, if you like, in terms of there's so much grief and loss out there. People must really be struggling. Mm -hmm. And so grief recovery, although it sort of seems like a departure, actually is like just a natural step towards helping people on, on a much more personal level. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now we, we talked a bit about this uh, kind of before recording, of course, mm -hmm. and um, talked about, you know, what grief and loss and all of that conjures up. And I mm -hmm. mentioned a couple of examples of, uh, I did a video recently of, um, you know, reframing a situation that when my grandfather passed away in front of me when I was about 12, didn't realize how traumatic that was. Mm -hmm. um, and also, and we'll come back to this as well, but I lost my mum 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I never really got over that. I never had any counseling or anything like that for yeah. that. And um, so what, what are the implications kind of, you know, not just for me, this is not a, ther a therapy session for me, Helen, but, mm -hmm. you know, across the board, what are the implications then if we don't deal with 
grief and loss and all of that in the way that, that you can help people with? Yeah, I think the thing that the, the, the two examples that you've mentioned are the ones which we most commonly associate with grief. And mm -hmm. that is the bereavement, you know, through the loss of a loved one. Yeah. I think what happens and that people don't necessarily give enough value to is the fact that loss and therefore grief can come in many, many forms. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can have the loss of, of our health. We can have a bereavement. We can have the loss of a relationship, which doesn't mean the person is physically gone. They may still be there, just not in our lives anymore. Loss of trust, loss of faith. And when we come to loss of career, particularly from a, a COVID Point of view then obviously that goes into all sorts of things like loss of attachment and loss of territory and loss of structure and all yeah. of those kinds of things and if we think okay well if those are things we can lose what is what is grief and actually it's the natural and normal reaction to or emotional reaction to any change in in our lives mm -hmm. and and those can be tangible changes like physically losing a person or they can be very intangible changes like the change in our lives that lockdown brought, you know? Um, and it's also the conflicting feelings that we get when there's a change or an end in our familiar patterns of behavior. So, wow, for sure, COVID and lockdown has done that to every single one of us. You know, the change from going to an office every day to working from home, to being able to go and deliver training, to not being able to do any work at all. You know, the, the massive changes, even just to, requiring to queue when you go to buy your groceries or wearing yeah. a full mask and all of these changes which all of us are having to to deal with so um although the examples you gave are of course real living exam and your own lived examples of 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 loss they aren't the only ones that are there mm -hmm. and i think we as i say don't give enough a kind of conscious awareness to the fact that actually we have we have loss all the times in our all the time in our lives and our unresolved grief is really about uncommunicated communication of an emotional nature. So mm, the things mm. we wish we had and hadn't said, or the things that we wish we had or hadn't done, or that we wish somebody else had or hadn't said or had or hadn't done. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's 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 interesting that in a work context, um, particularly having gone through pandemic times, there is a, a huge quantity of of loss. Yeah. And people don't recognize it as loss. And you asked, what's the impact of it? Um, well, there's been some studies by McKinsey in the States, and they've said that, they, that a third of every of all senior executives are affected by this um, at some point. And the cost to the US economy is $75 billion. Wow. Well, I imagine that the cost to the UK economy is, you know, somewhere in the same, in the same kind of region. Yeah, and yeah. If you take it to its final extreme of people who can't deal with what's happening in their world and they take you know the, the most final step they can take and you know which is obviously ending their pain through suicide the numbers are humongous mm -hmm. um and yeah those are numbers that you just don't even want to contemplate where people have got to a point where they can't carry on yeah yeah what, what kind of loss they've gone through that's led them to to feeling that helpless yeah so what i'm kind of hearing then from you helen is that you know loss is a is almost a you know there's a bit of a spectrum really isn't there from a you know what might deem to be a sort of fairly straightforward you know loss of a routine or maybe loss of a job loss of cha changing career or changing circumstances yeah. uh, that's one kind of loss you know through to uh, you know the grief that we associate with a bereavement and stuff like that yeah. um and you're right i mean and that's the the whole purpose of of kind of men able was you know consciously aware that uh, for men in particularly in particular you know we're not good at talking about it and the ultimate is that some some people you know may feel that their only choice might be to do something drastic yeah. uh, and of course we, yeah. we want to stop that but so your your work involves helping people recognize that those changes in circumstances and you know even if it is a, a bereavement yeah. uh, will create a sense of loss and then how you how do you help someone through that then well, the grief recovery method is um, unlike counseling mm -hmm. in that it's, although it does involve talking, so yeah. counseling would be, some forms of counseling would be uh, talking therapy. So although it does involve talking about what, you know, what you're going through and the emotional honesty about how you feel about what's, what's taking place, um, the grief recovery method actually provides um, people with actionable steps that they can take to work through that. Mm -hmm emotional pain 
um, unlike some counseling where you unpack everything, talk about it, and then you pack it all back up again, and that's the end of your session. Um, so the grief recovery program really does actually give you steps to take, which are great skills to learn because once you understand what those skills are and those steps are, you can take them repeatedly every yeah. time you come up against something in, in your life that you know causes the, these conflicting feelings of emotion or changes to your patterns of behavior. You can become complete with that new emotion that you're feeling yeah. and not allow it to cause the kind of pain and disruption that it causes in people's lives. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I think, I mean, you know, even I've learned something today and we've spoken a few times about this and, you know, I'm, I've learned that, that that whole area of grief and loss, you know, isn't just about a bereavement and obviously bereavement is, is bad enough on its own, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you can be feeling like that just from, a, as we've said, that change of circumstances. So, um, you know, there's, there's real transitions in our lives that, that kind of create those moments. Mm. So if you think about going right from a young age, uh, starting school, and then moving from transitioning from primary school into secondary school, that's, a, that's quite a big one, which people um, don't necessarily associate. They kind of think of starting big school as a real big deal, but actually transition from primary to secondary is huge. Yeah, that's a good point, actually, yeah. Yeah, the transition from high school into university or further yeah. education, where suddenly you're no longer a child, you're now an adult. Mm -hmm. It's an enormous step for mm -hmm. a lot of young adults to take. And then as we go through our adult life, changes in career, you know, even if we make that choice ourselves, even if we resign, we choose to resign from a job, actually that's a loss mm, mm. because we're losing some of the familiarity and some of the thing and some comfort potentially. We may be losing things that are negative that we don't like. Yeah. And yeah. also equally we're losing some of the things that make us feel comfortable. Um, so whether that change is self-perpetuated or something that happens to us, for example, a redundancy where we have no control over it, those are all transition periods right up to retirement, which is a massive transition, which a lot of people don't prepare for. <laughs> that's very true, actually. And um, yeah, that's one of the things that sort of started me on this was my financial advisor actually said to me a few months ago, he said, I can't envisage you ever having what we might describe as a cliff edge retirement, you know, that sort of 31st of March and I'm finished and, you know, all the staff go out and buy me presents and cakes and what have you. And off I go to a, a life of sitting in a shed sometime. Mm. Um, or playing golf or, or whatever. And, and I can't, you know, I can't see me doing that. And I think that's, that's a good point. It's partly because you, yeah, you, you don't want to sort of close down those things that you've been used to. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you create a whole bag of stuff for yourself that you weren't even aware was going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Exactly. I actually did speak to a young chap who, who reached out to us uh, a few weeks ago and um, his company had actually offered him a redundancy package, but he was in really in two minds because um, he loves the job. He's been there a long time. And mm -hmm. just talking to you now, I'm wondering if, if he'd almost got himself into a kind of sense of, of loss, um, you know, and, um, what's the word, you know, inertia almost that he couldn't mm -hmm. kind of make a decision one okay. way or the other, because he was, he was, you know, worried about how he would feel afterwards. Do you know what? Interestingly, grief plays a very funny trick with time. Hmm. I kind of, I, I say it turns it into treacle sand. So sand in that it runs through your fingers really, really fast. And one day moves into the next uh, unbelievably quickly. Time just mm. goes. Equally, it's like treacle where one day is just so long. You think it's never going to end. Yeah, yeah. The, the impact that grief can have on our physiology and our ability to function is unbelievable. And that's why it affects productivity so much in the workplace. And I can understand that example that you've just given because he, we can, we can um, experience loss, an impending loss. So for example, in the, in the um, example you've given of that person who's probably already imagining what it might be like, that can happen if we've got a loved one who has dementia, for example, mm -hmm. or yeah. a terminal illness, and we know that we're going to lose that person. So we can begin to grieve already. Mm. And with grief comes a whole host of things lack of concentration, loss of motivation, the inability to, to maintain our focus on anything for a particularly mm. long period of time, um, high emotion. And then for some people, an enormous full on workaholic, you know, just bury yourself in work and yeah. try and forget about everything else, which in itself leads to burnout and stress. Yeah. 
yeah. So, yeah, it can do very damaging things to us. No. And I guess when people say, oh my God, I feel this way, I feel down, I, I can't get out of bed, I don't feel motivated, you know, oh, and people encourage them, they say, gosh, you know, maybe you should go and see your doctor, you, you know, you don't, it doesn't sound well. And they think, maybe, God, maybe what's wrong with me? Mm. There's something wrong with me. And they go to the doctor and the doctor goes, oh, those all sound like classic symptoms of depression. So they get medicated. And actually what they're not dealing with is, is the loss, the emotional experience that they yeah. have. Yeah. So they're not, they're not dealing with the root cause. And, and yeah. I think you're and absolutely. Really, yeah. So that again, sorry. I was saying that. So the medication gives them a symptomatic relief of, of, of how they're feeling yeah. rather than dealing with the underlying cause. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I mean, clearly, you know, going to the doctor is a, is a good step. Um, there are, you know, medications that you can take and, and symptoms, uh, sorry, interventions that they can create for you. Uh, but I'm also very mindful that, you know, getting to the doctors at the, uh, in this time at the moment is challenging. Um, and typically the wait list for NHS counselling is about 12 weeks. Yes. Um, Lushy, I think, depending on where you live. Yeah, okay. exactly. Exactly. And so, you know, that's not to be critical of that at all, because it's a fantastic service. But, um, you know, somebody may feel that actually they, they don't necessarily need all of that. They just need some sort of short, sharp intervention to help them, you know, refocus and reframe uh, yeah. a little bit. So so what what in terms of the, the men able movement then, um, Helen, what have you, you know, obviously you've seen what we're what we're about. You We've talked the other day about you being very much a part of you know, people that we can refer to you and stuff like that. So what, what do you see in terms of what you do and how that links with what, what we're trying to achieve? I think the, the reason that your cause, because that's kind of your mission, resonates so strongly with me is because mental health, and we discussed this the other day, I think people, it's great that people are much more able or willing to talk about mental well-being. Mm -hmm. So it's quite... Um, used as a phrase and people talk about it but i think they're happy to talk about it when it's not them right they yeah. can talk about mental well-being and mental health when it's about someone else mm -hmm. but when and and i'm and when we're talking about it being my problem or something that i've got an issue with then people are much less inclined to talk about it and particularly men yeah. are yeah. much less inclined to talk about it I heard an amazing little phrase just this morning on a podcast, which was actually with, um, with Vice President Joe Biden. And he said that exposure is liberation. And I actually think that that's incredibly uh, mirrors what you're trying to do yeah. by exposing what this is and opening it up and allowing people to say, you know what, it's not just me. There are many other men who have stress, who have burnout, who are carrying loss and grief around them. Um, actually by exposing that it liberates them to talk about it yeah, yeah. and so that's why it's so you know that it, it's so, it resonates so strongly with me is because actually for me the grief recovery work and my coaching work is all about helping people to to improve their, their lives mm -hmm. and so by talking about our emotion and becoming emotionally literate and being able to speak openly about how we feel and being emotionally honest um is really really beneficial and if you're a manager in a business and you're carrying grief and loss with you that can manifest in a in a way to to your team and to the people that you manage that can become incredibly cold very dismissive um, because you're not able to deal with what's going on with them because you you know you have no resilience to deal with even what's going on with yourself yeah. So, I, I, I would also say, actually, um, interestingly, I've, I've observed, and I think the, inter, the automotive industry is probably um, susceptible to this, that yes, there are uh, issues with managers perhaps being sometimes a bit cold and a bit, you know, reserved. Mm -hmm. But I think on the other side of it, there could also be an element of going overboard and perhaps being a bit egotistical and a bit kind of seeking uh, external verification and, you know, or validation and stuff like that. And I think that can, e can equally um, create challenges within your team as well yeah for sure for sure and I think again we, when we come to kind of talking about mental health and being vulnerable enough to, to, to talk about your own uh, mental health issues um, is something that if men are 
encouraged to do that more and not penalized or criticized in mm. any way for doing it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then that's a better place to be. But I can remember hearing someone say, Oh, I didn't want to pull the mental health card. Yeah. Wow. When very clearly, <laughs> yeah. When very clearly he was experiencing massive stress and burnout. Yeah. And actually, yeah. that's how people see it. Mm. So people pull the mental health card when they can't cope anymore. My question is, why can't they cope anymore? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think it's worth stressing as well that, um, you know, we all have mental health just as we all have physical health. Um, I heard somebody on something say something the other day about uh, oh, this person suffering with mental health. Well, you know, we all have mental health. And I think in a, in a business, particularly in a, in a performance related one like the automotive industry, you know, if we had lots of people, you know, eating all the wrong things and, and had heart disease and diabetes and all this other related stuff you know we very soon do something about it wouldn't we, wouldn't we? Mm, um yeah. and when it comes to mental health you know that we we need to also think you know, about I, what's I, contributing I, to that no and i think that's part of the pro- part of the the stigma i guess that's mm-hmm. attached to it is that it's invisible mm-hmm. you know so you have a broken leg or you have you know i don't know you sprained your wrist or you you need glasses or anything <laughs> about your physical being. Yeah. People can see it and they can, they can understand it. They go, oh, yes, okay, Steve needs glasses. That yeah. doesn't make him less able to do his job. He mm-hmm. just needs glasses. Okay, you won't be a fighter pilot, but hey. You know, <laughs> yeah, don't remind me of that, Helen. I'm still dealing with that. <laughs> <laughs> but when you can't see what's happening. No, it's true. And society also, um, and our culture, mm-hmm creates an environment which doesn't allow us to exhibit some of the things which we might be feeling some mm-hmm. of our emotions and we just pack them all away how does anybody know what's going on no indeed yeah. and therefore yeah. oh we want a break oh we just fancy a break so we'll pull the mental health card you know it it doesn't it, it's just not there yeah, and when i talk about that and particularly with regard to men um we we talk about the six myths of grief mm-hmm. and those six myths are that um, you shouldn't feel bad. Okay? I'm going to write so, these down, by the way. So don't feel bad. <laughs> okay, so don't feel bad. Yeah. Uh, so something happens. Um, I'll give you an example of, uh, from a, a, let's say a child's example. So um, a child comes home, they haven't done particularly well in an exam. And as a parent, you go, oh, do, you know, don't feel bad. I'm sure you, you tried as hard as you could. Maybe they didn't. Maybe mm-hmm. they didn't try as hard as they could. Maybe they didn't revise as well as they could, you know, but by telling the person not to feel bad, we prevent them from actually expressing the emotion that they're feeling. Right. Now I'll give you the opposite of that. Kid comes home with a fantastic score report. Well, let's put it in the automotive industry. Sales guy has hit all of his targets for the month, right? Happy, happy. He's ecstatic. He comes home and it's other half system. Don't be happy. Don't be happy. We wouldn't do that, would we? Because we're no. very comfortable <laughs> with a happy, optimistic emotion. Yeah. But yeah. we're very unhappy and rather uncomfortable with one which which doesn't feel that way. So we tell people not to feel bad because as humans, we want people to feel good. We want to bring them up. Mm-hmm. But what we do is we prevent them from expressing their emotion. The next one is replace the loss, and that one is is um, you know, so something is broken, something doesn't work you've lost something or someone um, and so you replace that with something else and that replacement could be food it could be alcohol it could be more work and those things if you imagine them you could say to me oh Helen those don't don't sound too bad you know I go home and have a glass of wine at night you know that's is that such a bad thing and it's not a bad thing until it becomes a habit that has a tiny cue which causes you to go and repeat that habit over and Mm, over again The one that really plays to what happens to men is the third myth, which is be strong. Mm. And that's the one that men get a lot and feel that I think culturally they are required to be strong. Mm -hmm. They tend to be the primary breadwinners. They tend to be the ones who, you know, take the lead. And so when something goes wrong, they can't be emotional. They have to be strong. They have to be strong for everyone around them. Yeah, yeah. Is affecting all of us, all of men who might be on furlough, 
are the ones who are consoling the rest of the family going you know don't worry it's okay when internally they're thinking what the hell am i going to do yeah yeah yeah. it's a it's a caveman thing isn't it i suppose where it's you know don't worry i'll you know i missed that antelope i'll go out and hunt another one yeah and and we perpetuate be strong because Gosh, if I had a pound for every be strong I'd seen on LinkedIn or Facebook over this period of time with everyone going, oh, it's okay, be strong, you know? And actually, maybe you don't want to be strong. Maybe just for a change, we should be Absolutely, human. yeah, yeah. Just, you know, yeah. Being strong. So um, the, uh, the fifth one, grieve alone. I've missed number that, four. What was number four, Helen? Oh, number four is be strong. Okay, of course it is, yes. But we'll do a little summary at the end. Oh, we'll so. do a summary at the end. Well, so we don't feel bad. Replace the loss. Be strong. Sorry, that was three. Number four, grieve alone. Um, and, grieve and that alone. is okay. about we don't want to see this expression of any emotion that you have. So please go do that by yourself. Mm. Right. And whether it's overtly said or felt, mm-hmm. like I'm embarrassed. I don't want to. I don't want people to see me not coping. Mm-hmm. So I keep it to myself. And actually, research shows that loss shared it enables a much quicker recovery than mm. one that we keep for ourselves mm. um keep busy <laughs> mm. so that's again the the be strong and keep busy often go hand in hand because i'm going to be strong and in order to be strong i need to distract myself so i'll just keep myself, myself busy and that way i don't have to think about what's going on yeah yeah So cue lots of DIY over COVID, lots of painting of sheds and mowing of lawns and trying to keep busy, you know? And yes, that was partly about the fact that there was nothing else to do, but also partly about a distraction because Mm. otherwise, what were you going to do? Sit and watch the news, you know? Just couldn't do that all day. No, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, I get that completely. And the last one is um, time heals all wounds. Oh. You know, so I think all of us have heard that at some point in our lives. Just like, well, don't worry, you know, just give it time and things will get better. Just yeah. give it time, you'll feel okay. Now I'll give you an analogy. Time is a healer, isn't it? That's the yeah, that's the so typical phrase. Yeah. Yeah. The thing is that you know, Steve, it's not time, it's what you do in the time. Mm-hmm. That heals. So I'll give you a, an example, a fun example that we'll all get. You're driving down the road and you get a puncture. Okay, so if I said to you, Steve, what I want you to do is I want you to get out of the car, take a walk around, have a look at the tire, then maybe you go to your boots, pull out a deck chair, open it up, sit down next to the car and just wait. And at some point, you know, time heals and the tire will reinflate and off you'll go on your way. Well, you and I both know that that's never going to happen. Mm-hmm. The only way that puncture is going to be fixed is either by you a, calling the AA or getting the jack out yeah, and other recovery services are available, but <laughs> yes, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, you know, the other thing is that you're going to fix it yourself. Yeah, you know? yeah, true. So it isn't the time that elapses that heals; it's what we do. What in you the do time. with it? Yeah, yeah. So when people are grieving and when they when they have suffered loss, how long do you have to wait before you start to feel better? Mm, if time mm. heals all wounds, how much time? Mm. Is it six months? Is it six weeks? Is it six years? Is it the rest of your life before you feel better? Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally get that. I'll tell you, there is another, there's another issue uh, or, or thing for me on that front. And, and we talked about this on the phone the other day that, um, you know, I've heard people say that when they've gone through some sort of grief or loss or whatever, that the thing that they need to do, let, let's put this in the context of a bereavement, for example. And I had this mentioned to me a lot, you know, people said, oh, you've got to get closure. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, in my case, losing my mum 20 years ago, I never want to close that you know, she was special to me clearly. And, you know, yeah, the the loss will never leave me. Um, I think, as you said, what I do in the time is 20 years. So it was a long time. I've done a lot since then. Um, But I never want to get closure on it. So what's your view on that? And so within the grief recovery method, we don't, we don't use the word closure. Mm. Uh, We talk about becoming emotionally complete with your loss. Mm -hmm. So you're in the last that you've explained about your mum becoming going through the grief recovery process and completing with that wouldn't it doesn't you're never gonna as you rightly said the loss will never be gone Mm. um but what the grief recovery method is about is allowing you to let go of the pain that's associated with that loss Mm. 
yeah. so that you no longer have that emotional um, reaction to it mm -hmm. and all of the other things that can come with having that emotional reaction to it, but that you can enjoy those fond memories without coming to a place where you feel pain. Right. Um, so a lot of times people say, oh, you need closure because actually that'll help you to get over something. Uh, so for an example, um, somebody's a loved one is killed in a motor car accident, let's say, and another driver was at fault. That family may wait for a court case, feeling, hoping that if that other driver gets some form of justice or the justice that they feel is, is enough, that then they'll feel better, mm. that then they'll mm. have closure. But it doesn't necessarily take away the emotional pain that they have. No, I so um, I agree with you. Closure isn't something that we seek from a grief recovery point of view. We are looking to become emotionally complete because sometimes your emotion isn't sadness either. Yeah. Your yeah. emotion is anger. Um, so we talk about becoming complete with the emotion that, mm -hmm. that you have associated with it. So that no longer causes you pain. Brilliant. Okay. Helen, that's been amazing. So what we've got then is uh, I was going to ask you for three top tips, but I think you've exceeded that by giving us six myths. <laughs> of, uh, of grief grief and loss and they were uh, don't feel bad uh, yeah. don't the, the one myth about replacing the loss i guess that don't replace the loss isn't it that's yeah uh, is what that's mm -hmm. about really uh, be strong mm -hmm. um, grieving alone is is yeah. another myth you know that we have mm -hmm. to do that keep busy uh, and then the big one of time healing all wounds or you know time's a healer um, mm -hmm. so i think that's that's really good helpful advice um, but uh, if you do have any top tips <laughs> for us, uh, particularly around, I think the issue is, you know, because obviously we're going to position this as, as a podcast about grief and loss and mm -hmm. people will have a different perception on that. And I, I guess a lot of people may actually immediately jump on what, what I thought it was about, which was, you know, bereavement particularly, but you're absolutely right. It's more than that, isn't it? So what would be your top tips for perhaps considering, you know, some of those other aspects of, of grief and loss? I would say that if you just have a little reflection on your life, mm -hmm. think, well, what have I been through? And you'll right. identify, you know, even moving house, Steve, we haven't even talked about the intangible stuff. Right. To, yes. You know, to because even moving, a, even, ha even moving house can be a big deal. Pet loss is huge. Mm -hmm. for a lot of people. Um, they, so there are, there are a great number of them. There really are. Yeah. Um, I would just say, allow yourself to, if you start to feel like some of the ways we've talked about today, lack of motivation, uh, burnout, those kind of things, it take a few minutes to go, what's actually going on here? Yeah. yeah. What am I actually feeling? What is the emotion that I'm feeling? Why am I feeling that emotion? Where is that coming from? Mm. And, you know, you have some self-reflection, some time to look at that and think, where is it coming from? Mm. And it's, it's likely that it's coming from a place of loss. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, did, I did have, I did write a note or two down actually about what leaders can do in organizations because I think that if we want to shift the way people feel um, about talking about emotion, we have to change the culture of the organization. Oh, now group. we're talking, Helen. Now you're on my, we're definitely on the same page. <laughs> we always were, but this <laughs> culture and leadership in, in the automotive industry is exactly what we're about. So go on, tell us mm -hmm. what, what, you, uh, what your thoughts are on that. So for me, really, it's about, it's about leaders setting the right tone mm. within their organization mm -hmm. um, and really recognizing. So that would be the first thing, setting the tone to go, do you know what? Actually, it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, it's okay for, the, for people to not be okay in our organization. It's okay for there to be people who are struggling mm -hmm. and actually creating space for that to, to happen. Yeah. Um, and also making a provision for that to be the case so people don't have to land up going off on long-term strengths and long-term sickness, but actually they have a far better, more actionable way of dealing with, with how they're feeling. Yeah. So yeah. setting the right tone for me is a, is, is a big deal. Um, and, the, and then recognizing that there is grief in, mm -hmm. in every organization. And the third thing is talking about it. Right. And that has, come, yeah. that has to come from the top. Managers have to let the people that work in their teams know that it's okay to talk. Yeah, yeah. And 
what that requires is a sea change in some people to allow themselves to be vulnerable about how they feel. Because uh, if we do that, other people are more inclined to reflect back what they've seen. Yeah. So if somebody can see me being emotionally honest and open about how I'm feeling, they're much more likely to give me the same back. Mm -hmm. If somebody sees me being strong and, hey, hey, it's all okay, I'm going to get exactly the same back from them. Mm -hmm. So set the right tone, recognize that there's grief and make space to talk about it. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, I love all of that. And of course, I mean, you know, from a kind of business perspective, one of the angles that we're coming from with this as well is about giving organizations effective employees back. Um, because you mentioned there about people going off sick, you know, and actually there is also the, the dropping effect, effectiveness or productivity from people who are going through some of these things. And as leaders, you know, we need to be able to, you know, stop and observe that and see what's going on. Um, I saw, I got an example yesterday, actually. Uh, I sent a message to somebody and said, have you got any contacts at this particular organization? Um, and he came back and he went, don't, you know, for us to talk to, of course. And he, he came back and said, don't bother. They're a bunch of Neanderthals. Wow. And I was like, wow, okay, that's, that's a shock. What, what do you mean? Um, mm -hmm. And he said that their, their management culture is if anyone was to approach them with a, a mental health issue or concern or challenge or stresses, you know, typically the type of phrase they would use would be put a bit of spit on it and, and go home. Um, totally unacceptable in my book. It is. And sadly though, that still happens. Yeah. You know, and there are still, and there are still people who feel that they can't talk about what's bothering them because that's exactly the reaction that they're likely yeah. to get. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I think with your three, those top tips there, set the tone, uh, recognize the grief and then getting talking about it, you know, you are setting the, that kind of culture, that tone of voice within your business that will set you apart as an employer you know, and, and hopefully make you not like that, that other lot that we talked about. Yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. Brilliant. Now, um, Helen, you're clearly going to be a part of the uh, men able movement and part of the sort of wider extended family, if you like, of people that we'll, we'll put in touch with anyone who needs help. But uh, outside mm -hmm. of that, how can anyone contact you and, uh, and get hold of you sort of privately? Okay, so um, I'm on LinkedIn, okay. Helen Arthur. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's easy to grab me there. On Facebook, Helen Arthur Consulting Limited. Um, both of those so, uh, those platforms have links to my grief uh, web, website, so you can mm -hmm. go straight there as well. You can book a call with me through that or just send me a message. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being on the Men Able Matters podcast. And uh, maybe we'll probably definitely have you back again at some point in the future to talk a little bit more because I sense that there's probably a fair bit more to go at uh, on the grief recovery method. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it's been a great pleasure to talk to you, Steve. Thanks very much for having me. Good stuff. Thanks ever so much. You take care and we'll speak to Thanks. you soon. Okay, you too.